Audio Jungle. Hi everyone and welcome to our next second part of our series on offshore structuring, offshore banking and basically going international. And again I have with me Stephen and who is with us in the last one, our internationalization expert. And today we're going to be focusing on offshore structures and how basically to set yourself up for everything from tax minimization to asset protection to getting best customer focus, expansion, all that kind of stuff. So welcome Stephen, great for us to be back together again. Yeah, it's good to be here Warren, how are you? Yeah, I'm well, look, I mean, we've been, you know, we're spending too much time together, mate, getting too familiar here. I know, people start talking, surely. I know, it's scary, eh? So, anyway, Stephen, so I'm going to start off with a simple question. So, obviously we spoke yesterday about offshore banking and things like that, so really my first question to you is, what's the real advantage of getting an offshore structure? So, what's, why, why would someone not just turn up to Hong Kong or Singapore tomorrow, fly in and just open a bank account and fly home again. What's the real benefit to them actually setting up offshore? Okay, so setting up fully offshore, um, it also looks at um, what you want to do so um, and, and who you are. But the main thing that I look at when setting up offshore is simply opportunity. Um, yeah. you, you're gaining so much more opportunity by, by being structured offshore. And, and I look at it this way. If you, you're an Australian, you're based in Australia and you, you're just concentrating on the Australian marketplace, the Australian market's 1.82% of world GDP. So that leaves 98% of the world's GDP uh, out of your bounds that you're not even looking at. You're not even considering if all you're doing is looking at Australia. And same so with America pay as well, really, isn't it? Same, same with America. America's 20% of the world's GDP, so they're leaving 80% set on the head. Uh, Europe, Europe is 20% of the world's GDP, so they're leaving 80% out. So by, by thinking beyond your borders and then setting up structures in place, in places like Hong Kong or Singapore, um, you can then take advantage of that 100% that of global trade and then give yeah. yourself more opportunity to expand your business and have a better business, to be able to go and live the life that you want to live, to bank and and to enjoy all the freedoms that, that come come with being an internationalised type person. That's good. So, I mean, why would someone in America say not just use an American LLC? What's really the benefit that an offshore structure would give them? I mean, surely an American LLC can go and do business in other countries as well, can't it? Oh, it can do. And and just about any structure in, in, in the world can do. But it gives you a focus offshore. Plus, it also gives you separation from your government. So if you're an American and you're looking to set up offshore, uh, setting up, say, even asset protection vehicles in Nevis, um, so set up a Nevis LLC that owns uh, corporations then in the US, um, that goes to split your assets. Uh, jurisdictions, and this is where boundaries are coming to our favour, that if you're set up in Hong Kong, you're set up in Nevis, or, and, and then you also have operations in the US, the wealth and everything that you build up offshore is very hard for someone then in the US to, to legally put a law, uh, lawsuit over and, and put a charging order over. So if you look at Nevis LLCs, they don't, the Nevis government doesn't allow charging orders. So it means that if you own the share in it, the court can say that share is now given to someone else. Those orders do not exist with a, with a, um, a Nevis LLC neither with using uh, Belize IBCs uh, or some of the other uh, structures around the place where uh, you can divorce your ownership from um, the actual um, control of the entity. Gotcha, that's really good. So, I mean, one question I have, because obviously it's asked, it was asked to me last year by the ABC reporter, when they were getting a statement on the Panama Papers, and, all, and clients asked this too, and of course, any tax office will ask this, isn't just setting up an offshore company just a, really just a kind of tax minimization scheme or tax avoidance or tax dodge? Isn't that really all it's for? Not at all. Uh, and it's completely the opposite. Um, basically, setting up offshore is, is all about, one, protecting your assets, two, increasing your opportunities, three, um, having uh, an international outlook. Uh, the tax to me, when, when I'm setting up stuff for clients, tax is an added bonus. Just because we can leverage 
um, the different tax rates of different jurisdictions, well, that's an added bonus. I've had some clients that we've set up, they've been American clients, and we've actually set them up in Europe. So there hasn't been a lot of tax advantages, but they've been able to gain access into the European market, take advantage of any trade deals and, and other uh, tax, um, tax treaties and, and trade treaties uh, to be able to work their business to the maximum. Yeah, that so makes sense. I mean, not me thinking, thinking there because I've got clients who set up US LLCs all the time and the pure reason they do it is because Amazon, doing an Amazon business, it's far better for them to work with Amazon. And I've got clients who they will go on to buy property in places like Portugal or Philippines or others and they have to have a company set up in those jurisdictions to do it. Or if you're investing in certain things in Dubai and other places, you need to have a Dubai company or they won't even look at you. So. And I know that one of my clients, who's Australian, has a lot of UK customers, and he was finding that too many UK customers were nervous dealing with an Australian company, um, which I found quite funny. So eventually, yeah. he set up a, a UK. So he set up a UK company, and immediately his customers felt more comfortable. So there's actually I've given four immediate reasons, and I even was thinking of another client who once wanted to go into an investment offshore. That was a great opportunity, and they wouldn't they wouldn't talk to him in Australia because of ASIC rules. So he ended up setting up a company over in Singapore so he could go in. And, and that, that works all the time. There are so many investment opportunities out there, like uh, there's some agricultural stuff in Central America, where they won't even look at you unless you have uh, an offshore company, unless you're set up in the BVI or the Cayman Islands or anywhere like that, because they do not want to get tangled up uh, with the, the rules from America or the US or uh, from the US or Australia or the UK uh, around funds. Um, so they don't want to be seen as running a collective fund. So they want people to be seen as, you know, structured as as institutional investors or or sophisticated investors. Yeah. So really, tax. Because ironically, I was even thinking that with tax, that I know that I've had clients who we've been talking about offshore, and they've even said to me, "We don't. I mean, the tax is important, obviously, but they said there's no way we want to risk the security of our money or anything else." And Ultimately, what's highly important to them is a good jurisdiction, a good structure that can really have safe money, that's got good banking, um, good international exposure, and then, of course, the tax is obviously a huge bonus as well. Yeah, so we, I like to use the term capital efficiency. So yeah. being able to use your capital in a more efficient manner uh, is highly more advantageous to you as, as an offshore person uh, than it is the government. Uh, they're only going to waste the money. So if we can set up your structure, say here in Hong Kong, uh, for your Amazon business with a, a US LLC looking after the US uh, side of things, um, a European uh, corporation looking after the European side of things, uh, and then use the capital because you know, Hong Kong's a territorial system, so you're not driving profits here in Hong Kong, we can use that profit to buy more stock, uh, to expand into other markets, uh, to even re reduce the prices a little bit. Uh, to your customers uh, to increase your your, um, your overall um, uh, selling. Uh, it could even work the other way. Uh, we can also use the the capital uh, to reinvest into other businesses and to grow your business uh, in, in a better way, in a larger way. Now that's really really good. I mean, would you even agree with me? I mean, how I see things is that it's never really tax is just one factor. The, ultimately, it's about return on investment. And let's say, for example, that you're investing in a country where, you know, you, you might go to a country where you might get, say, let, let, let's say, nine percent return on an investment, but you only pay like what you know taxes are really low the way it works over there. Whereas Australia or US, you might get ten percent, but after taxes, you only make seven percent. So really, taxes is ultimately is only a factor. It's about making more money. It's about growing your business, growing your wealth, and just in the same way, if I can go offshore and buy, buy bulk in Amazon or go to a wholesale grocer and buy that one and, save, and, and pay a lot less money for the same thing by going to Amazon, it's like in Philippines. I mean, right now, I, I used to be paying you know, 25 to 30 bucks an hour, Steve, you know, just for, a, yeah. for an administration manager in Australia to do basic admin and generally want a holiday leave and pay and sick pay, and then they would you know, want their rights and all that. Whereas, you know, I have someone in the Philippines who are paying, like, you know, obviously significantly less than that, and they're great workers, they want, they want the job, so I'm getting a better return on investment, and that's how I see it, really. 
yeah, well, we're the same. We've got staff in the Philippines. We've got staff in in um, uh, Estonia and other places like that. And you're paying next to nothing. Um, when I say next to nothing, it's very high for there. So we're in Estonia. It's about two thousand uh, two two thousand two hundred. Uh, U.S. dollars a month. Uh, in as you said, in the Philippines, you know, twelve to fifteen hundred U.S. a month um, is is quite a quite an um, sort of a average sort of wage there and for very highly skilled people. Uh, the people that we employ in Estonia are programmers, uh, engineers uh, that that look after some very complicated uh, back end technical things uh, in some of our businesses, as well as the guys in the Philippines are good marketing guys. They speak reasonable English. They they understand the the pros and cons of uh, of marketing, um, and we can leverage that. Where you know, if you're in Australia, uh, especially Australia, Australia is getting way out of hand for for staffing. Uh, those sort of jobs, um, you know, I'm afraid of going and disappearing because we can leverage overseas. Uh, even the US, like there's uh, one of the companies that we work for, did uh, high, uh, very high end welding. Uh, so military grade welding, and they were based in Australia, and they were making um, stuff for the military in the US. They ended up moving their entire operations to the US, uh, all the welders and everything, because the welders in Australia were 120 to 150 dollars an hour, Australian dollars an hour. So that's about uh, what 110, 115 US dollars an hour. The same welders, with the same specs, the same training, the same everything, were were 35 to 40. Uh, US dollars, so around the 60, about half the cost. This company went from being marginally profitable in Australia, um, and then only marginally being able to continue its its um, contract with the government, uh, to being you know profitable, able to expand its contract with the government, and they could deliver on time. And they moved to the US, and the US have high taxes, but it was just purely and simply because of the wages, uh, land they could get a bigger factory for cheaper money. Um, and and the red tape uh, around um, military con um, contracts was less. So wow, there's that advantageous, and you don't have to go to, you know, the small Caribbean islands uh, to be offshore. That's brilliant. So, okay, so now moving on to some of the actual specifics. So someone comes to you wanting to set up offshore. What would be? Where would you be setting them up? In what are the kind of questions you'd be asking them? So I'm like, say, hey, I want to go offshore. And set myself up and go globally. What would you be saying? Okay, the first thing that I do is we sit down and we look at look at a few things. So we, we sit down and we go, well, what are your goals? What are you trying to achieve? Do you want to grow your business for exit? Do you want a lifestyle business? Um, do do you want something you can pass on to your children? What, what are you trying to achieve with your business? Uh, what are you trying to to achieve with moving offshore? And sometimes we get business uh, non business owners. So people that are retired, so they're looking to to resettle and and do investments into to other parts of the world. So we're looking at their goals um, in in the initial stages. Then we look at where you want to go, where you're comfortable going. Some people aren't comfortable dealing with with China or Brazil or that, but they they're very comfortable dealing with Hong Kong and Singapore and and mainly in Europe. And that's fine. So then we can structure what we need to do. So. After a look like, an interview process, we'll build up a picture, a bit of an avatar of what the person's trying to do, and then we can use that avatar to then launch ahead and work on all the different aspects of what they're trying to achieve offshore. So, in a, in a case study, is uh, one that I use is um, I call it the the Uruguayan beef baron. So this is a guy that's got high grade beef in in Uruguay, um, which is a nice little place, and he wanted to export it. Uh, around the world, and he wanted mainly his target was high-end hotels. Okay, so the first lot of hotels we looked at were in the U.S. So we established him a, a corporate, a holding corporation in Panama, um, to to then launch into the U.S. From there, we established a U.S. LLC, uh, which was a marketing company that that went and met with distributors. So that distribution company. Um, Linked up with all the distributors that sent, sell, sold high-end beef into hotels and restaurants, namely New York and Chicago, Boston, uh, and a few other cases. So keeping it small. From there, once that was established and going, he ended up with contracts here in Hong Kong and Singapore with high-end hotels, the high-end hotels. So then we moved, moved part of his operation here into Hong Kong, 
and by having a global spread and a global reach, he's tripled the size of his business. Um, he's still living in Uruguay, but he now has reps that are based all over the world. So he keeps what he what he enjoys, and that's being a farmer, looking after his cows and getting the best beef. Uh, but he, the marketing side and the distribution side of his business, it's all grown and it's all run from a central headquarters in Panama, with with operations in Hong Kong and uh, and the US. And uh, so he's been able to grow and do what he wants to do, and tax never come into it from him. It was just making sure that we're getting the right product to the right people. Uh, and he was cutting out a lot of the middlemen, so his profits increased uh, in that. So that, that's just one little uh, case study uh, that we've been able to put together. So I know Hong Kong is an area that you really like, like a lot of the structures I've set up yep. and viewed, which we've done with clients and we've set up and worked together as a team on stuff, invariably we frequently end up in Hong Kong. Why Hong Kong? I mean, okay. why does Hong Kong work so well for so many countries? Um, Hong Kong is... It, it's just got a great rules base. It's an ex-British colony, so it's, it's got the, the British common law uh, interwoven throughout its, um, its charters. Uh, it's a territorial tax system, uh, and it, it works out where profits are made. It, it not, not necessarily where money's made, it's where profits are made. Uh, so that, that leaves it open um, to a very good interpretation of uh, being a, a place where you won't have to pay a lot of tax and you can really use your capital. It's got good expansion, expanse and reach into China and the rest of Asia. It's a financial centre in its world, in its own in the world. It's one of the, probably the best financial centres. Has great banks and very secure banks. Has good connections um, in the trade. So a lot of the people that that we're dealing with at the moment are Amazon sellers. So these are people that are, are selling on Amazon in the US. Uh, that are buying in China, uh, so it's it's good to have the the, the headquarters here uh, in Hong Kong, when they'll be able to buy in China and then reach and sell into the US. The the internet world is growing at such a fast rate that there's places like the Middle East uh, and Asia itself, Taobao in China, for instance, and Hong Kong is a great launching pad uh, for all those. Um, so, plus Hong Kong has some good tax treaties. Uh, and it has some good trade treaties with other nations around the world. And it's just seen as a very good tier one white jurisdiction. If you remember how I was talking about uh, yesterday with banking, um, we, there's, I, I work on three levels, the white, the grey and uh, the black. Then the white tier, Hong Kong is 100% white tier. It has white banks, white trading laws, uh, white jurisdictions, the companies, the, the international companies, the limited liability companies that you set up here are well renowned around the world. People are comfortable trading with Hong Kong, the same as Singapore. Um, so, so Hong Kong ticks just about every box. Does it work for everyone? No. But I my, that. Does Hong Kong work? Is there any times you wouldn't recommend Hong Kong as an example? Um, I, I wouldn't recommend Hong Kong, say, for an American that only ever wanted to do uh, asset protection for America. Um, it sort of doesn't work there. Um, it, and, and there is vehicles that work uh, in Hong Kong, like the Hong Kong pensions, uh, which are um, a very special class of uh, trust, uh, which is how they're, they're set up here, uh, where yeah. it's a fully trust, it's, it's, the, it's a pension, so it's a, a fully full pension product that is managed by an independent trustee. Uh, and this works very well for hedge fund managers, uh, people that own uh, a lot of financial assets um, to, to actually set up because it divorces their ownership from control. And that's a, that's a very um, a strong thing to do, especially when you're trying to protect assets, is you want to make sure who owns them and who controls them are totally separate. And right, gotcha. Yeah. And that's so never any other examples of Hong Kong where you wouldn't use Hong Kong? Pardon? Is there any other examples of where you would not use Hong Kong, like like in Europe or UK or any one of that? Where would uh, be I better probably, options? I would, if you were investing into property and stuff in um, in Europe, uh, I would use comp like a Malta company or a even a, a UK company to do that. Um, I wouldn't use Hong Kong for anything like that. I like Hong Kong for a lot of widget businesses and uh, online education, uh, anything that's, that's highly mobile. 
that really doesn't have a presence uh, other than than the internet or um, uh, trade, so trade like business. So anything out of that, so anything investment orientated uh, that is specifically investment orientated would look at other jurisdictions. Maybe Singapore. Singapore is very good for you know setting up your own style fund uh, and then leveraging. So you have a Singapore manager and then you use a Cayman Islands or a BVI registered fund. That's useful. Let's let's do a few more specifics there. So let's just cover some different classes. The so number one class, hedge funds. I mean, what kind of? So you mentioned Singapore, the Caymans Fund. Any any others? So what are good jurisdictions for someone wanting to run a, a hedge fund? And certainly keeping in mind that you got licensing and things like that, and getting some credibility. Regulated, yeah. So basically, there's only two jurisdictions that I look at for setting up a fund itself, uh, especially an offshore fund. One of those is the uh, BVI, British Virgin Islands. And the other one is the Cayman Islands. The Cayman Islands yep. probably has 80% of all the funds in the world uh, established there. So all the major guys, HSBC, Fidelity, PIMCO, you name it, the Soros Fund, they, they all have um, Cayman Islands registered vehicles. In the Cayman Islands, you can, you can set up a standalone fund and a standalone manager that's fully registered. And if you meet the, the criteria uh, in that jurisdiction, uh, you can be um, a fully licensed um, promoter of the fund and manager of the fund, but it's all offshore. So you're, you're really targeted to people that are retail investors that are outside of certain jurisdictions uh, are quite um, happily to invest in your fund uh, as long as you're not promoting it directly in that jurisdiction. So if you wanted to promote it in Australia, you really need to team up with an Australian FS FSL license um, provider. To, to be 100% unless it's sophisticated investors. But you can then set up a Singapore and, and partner with a Singapore fund manager and have that Singapore fund manager tuck you underneath and then you can, uh, you're, you're a higher grade of license uh, and more recognised uh, for, for managing that, that fund. Now, the other thing is you've got places like Malta, uh, Liechtenstein, uh, Luxembourg, which are all fund management jurisdictions, uh, Guernsey and, and Isle of Man as well. If your clients were uh, European focused, mainly high net worth, they're the jurisdictions that we'd look at, for, especially for registering the manager uh, and maybe even setting up a small feeder fund to a larger global based fund uh, based out of the Cayman Islands. And we right, can do so the same thing with Australia. Yeah, so you can set up a fund to fund structure. So you might end up, you might team up with a group of guys in Australia that have a local fund, and that fund invests into the, the international fund. So you do the same thing in the US and Europe. You have feeder funds that feed into the major uh, global funds. So you take your retail investors into here, then that fund has a mandate to invest into the global fund. Right, so that's gotcha. one way that we look at doing hedge funds and private family office funds and all that sort of stuff as well. That's really useful. So online business, you mentioned Hong Kong, you mentioned hedge funds. Um, what about just investing in, say, shares generally or doing trading options or forex or something? Okay, so if you're trading forex and options, you can use Hong Kong companies, but it's getting harder and harder, uh, especially around opening the bank accounts and getting corporate, uh, corporate accounts. There is other structures that we can use and other entities. So we can use probably uh, Malta, um, so Maltese companies. Uh, even use a, a UK company uh, and then um, have that company uh, as the, the front with a secondary company somewhere else that is holding uh, the balance of, of the assets. What you've got to be careful of with anything in the investment world is can it be deemed a passive, um, passive vehicle. So what I like about trading companies and all that sort of stuff going offshore is there is no question that they are an active entity. So you're not going to get caught up with someone at the tax office going, we don't believe that it's a non-active business. Where with the investment stuff, a lot of it is passive investments, especially if you're investing in shares in other companies. So we need to look at, at vehicles that segregate the ownership from the control. So we need to look at the Hong Kong pension, the offshore trusts, uh, where there is an independent trustee. Um, and that's the key. An independent trustee or an independent custodian, uh, so a bank, one of the, the private banks uh, around the world, these are the, the sort of structures that you use for your, 
your, your, your legacy investing, the investing that you want to keep uh, asset protection. Uh, Nevis LLCs are, are good for, uh, for this type of investment as well. Um, but on the tax side of things, uh, a lot of Australians are going to get caught going forward under the passive, uh, passive rules. Um, so we need to make sure that we are, we are teaming up the, um, the investments with the right sort of managers and the right custodians and also making sure that the person that's doing the investment, especially if they're retired, it may be better for them to move overseas, go and take advantage of Portugal or, yeah. you know, or Italy or somewhere <laughs> like that and, and keep a lot more of their money. That's the same with UK and US, though. I mean, pretty much any clients in the Western countries now, with the patrol foreign company rules, they tend to you know, hit passive investments quite hard. So I generally tell people if it's not an active business, you're going to pay taxes unless they're willing to move overseas. So, let, would you, so let's say that they moved overseas. Um, whereabouts would you recommend that they would, say, be holding their passive investments? Like what's a great jurisdiction just to do to go in very easy, open up a trading account without too much hassle, get the bank account, and just get something working with good tax benefits and all that. What would be yeah, your three main? Yeah, say if you're um, you're a retiree, retiree, you've taken yeah. um, uh, the um, the offshore. Say you're an Australian, you're living in Thailand, for instance. Uh, so yeah. you're under the pension plan over there, which which is uh, basically a tax-free retirement thing. A Singapore company, uh, um, Singapore. A company with a, a local director uh, using interactive brokers or one of those major uh, broking houses, uh, that, that would be a very good thing because then the, the, any income derived by that company that ends up coming to you uh, because you're non-Australian resident at that point in time uh, is, is basically tax-free. It's only well, when you still get taxed in the Australian system uh, and you're resident in Australia that you're going to pay tax on it. So let's give you another case study. Let's say you've got a UK or US person who's willing to move offshore. They want to open up an account for, let's say, passive investments only. They don't want to do Singapore because they don't want somebody else's director other than, than themselves. Where would you recommend? Um, say, say, we'll take the UK. So it's a UK person that wants to uh, have structured investments. We could look at Gibraltar, uh, for instance, open a Gibraltar company, uh, even an Isle of Man company. So the person would at that stage look at say living in, um, say they wanted to live in Spain, southern Spain for instance. The, the problem that you've got to make sure that you don't do with anyone is that you get caught up inside their tax, um, yeah. tax, you know, tax system. So yeah, a lot Spain. of these places, yeah. yeah, a lot of the places in Europe is you get caught up in the tax system quite easily because you spend more than, than six months in any one year there. So you can use the, the mole to gold and residency program where you're going to pay no more than 15,000 euros in tax in any one year. But if you live somewhere else for more than six months, say in Portugal or Spain, you're going to get caught in the Portuguese or Spanish income system. But if it was all set up into some sort of trust vehicle where the trustee was separate um, and then it was being managed uh, for you and on behalf and you only got a, a dividend every year um, or every month uh, out of that trust that, that, that you live on, but you can still yeah. use the trust to do investments, that's a better structure. But then you go and spend four months in Portugal, three months in Spain and then go back to the UK to see people for, for a couple of months if you wanted to, go to North Africa, come out to Australia uh, and just because you're a retired, if you're on that retired style or you're, you're young and, and you're just a, a free um, free travelling uh, investor type person, so um, there's a lot of angel type investors out there. Um, you may even look at setting yourself up in somewhere like Monaco, which is totally tax free. Uh, yeah. Austria, uh, there's some places in, in Austria that you can uh, do the same thing as well. Uh, but, so yeah, really, um, if, you, if you basically just stay, let's just say using a UK person, so I'm a simple UK guy. I said, look, I don't, want, I don't want to get too confused and complicated. I just want to set myself up to hold my shares and my stocks and my gold holdings and my bonds. Um, where, what, would you re what would you recommend for me? And no, I don't want a Singaporean director. I've heard Singapore's great, but what, what would you recommend for me? And I'm willing to um, move. That off. person, I would, look, I would actually look at doing a Malta. Um, Malta. Structuring, setting up in Malta, setting up a Malta company. 
um, I agree. setting up multi investment accounts uh, and and that maybe even involved uh, uh, investing through some of the Maltese funds um, and then uh, possibly look at getting the Maltese residency uh, but if you're a European um, citizen anyway you can go and live anywhere in Europe um, uh, at any time as long as you don't you don't expend any more than six months in any of that that one year period so you might go to Malta for for the summer for two months you might go to southern Spain for the uh, the English winter um, you might then go skiing or something if you want to up up in up in Spain, up in uh, the Alps up in in France or, or Switzerland um, and then you might come back to Malta for another two or three months um, but you, you can then just kiss, keep moving around. What you don't want to do is go and spend 12 months somewhere then you're caught up in that, that, that tax jurisdiction. But a Maltese company would be great there. Uh, but if you had some side business that you wanted to do, you, you could look at establishing an Estonian corporation that was owned by your Maltese company. Okay, so what would the Estonian company, how would, well, how would that make things better? Um, well, the Estonian companies, because you can uh, use them for um, basically anything, and they're a great little th the thing. The maximum is 20% tax, and it's done on distribution of profits. So, if you actually had uh, an Estonian company uh, that was doing um, a travel blog or an investment blog that you um, you had established, oh. or uh, it was a little side business that your wife had. Well, you could do it there, and then the Malta company could contract services to it, and basically wipe out any of the tax or any of the profits in the in the Estonian company. So it gives you asset protection, but because you're never distributing profits, you're never going to pay tax from the from the Estonian company. But again, it's also a European Union um, uh, recognised uh, country. And the yeah. banking system is quite well, but with with a European company, you can actually open a bank account anywhere in Europe. So basically, if I'm, that's good. So if I'm a UK person and I'm living overseas now, yeah, I have a multi company for my investments, keep fifteen thousand euros. Yeah. Have the Estonian company for my business. I'm um, or Hong Kong, either one. That's perfect. Um, what about what about something like intellect? A couple of other scenarios here. First scenario, what about intellectual? Um, property, like like I, I've got a business. I'm moving offshore. I want to separate my IP from my trading operations for obvious asset protection reasons. What where would I set up to hold IP best? I've heard say Shells is good. I've heard Netherlands Antilles. What what would you say there? Yeah, either of those two jurisdictions is good. Um, I also like the British Virgin Islands uh, with a local BVI bank account uh, to hold royalties. Um, the Bahamas uh, and um, uh, and the Caymans uh, are good places to, to hold sort of um, royalty-based income because there's, you're not distributing a lot of profit. Well, when I say not distributing a lot of profit, you're not doing a lot of transactions every year on that IP. So you might only do it once a quarter, or you might do it once a half, or you might do it once a year. So having a local account in in that jurisdiction um, suits that purpose fine. So uh, having the Seychelles with a Singapore bank account works. Um, as long as we can get it open and we've got the right story. A BVI company with a BVI bank account, Belize company with a Belize bank account, um, all those sort of work for that sort of stuff. But there's other structures and depending on how complicated your uh, entire uh, family is, we may be better off looking at a family office type structure where the family office is the owner of that uh, IP and that might be through a Panamanian foundation it might be through a Hong Kong pension or it might be through a, a Cook Islands International Trust. Um, and then nice. uh, that, that owns everything, but it also then owns all the, the, uh, the assets uh, to the hedge fund that you might own. Or you might become a fund of funds and then you invest in other funds from that jurisdiction. So in other words, that you're, I want to have, like, let's say that I've got money is not an issue for me, I just want it done right. Yeah. I might have a company to run my business in, say, Hong Kong or a Estonia or somewhere. Then I might have my IP owned in somewhere like the Caymans or the Virgin Islands or even the Bahamas. And then I have it actually owned in the shares rather than my own name by a Panamanian foundation or a Hong Kong pension fund, something like that. Yeah, something like that or an international trust that's set up in, in Nevis or um, even or the Cook Islands. Uh, that, that, they're, 
they're highly plausible and highly valid um, ways of doing it. Once you start getting into the family office world, that's where we're starting to get into the black world. And that's where uh, it costs a lot more to run because you do need to use trustees and you also need to make sure that you're able to, to fly to those, those jurisdictions. So family offices, five million sort of assets plus, uh, are quite comfortable to, to set up in that realm. But that doesn't mean that you can't go offshore today. Um, anyone, anyone earning about $50,000 a year, as far as I'm concerned, in their business should be moving and are looking offshore, especially if you're an entrepreneur, you've got a trading business and you're buying and selling uh, product from not, not just China, but you might be buying product from Europe and selling it in Australia and buying Australian product and, and selling it in the US. Um, Obviously, so you, the only so go on, Stephen. Yeah, you should be looking to, to structure yourself offshore. And then as, to, as things grow, then we can bring in residency, which we'll talk more about tomorrow. And then oh, we can yeah. bring in other different structures uh, that, that can go in where, wherever, wherever we need to. And we can build up the whole picture. Um, if you're looking for asset protection from day one, uh, because you have a high net worth or you're in an industry like a doctor or a lawyer and you want to protect your assets, well, that's a different different story and it will um, will mean that we have to sit down and, and look at things a bit differently. Yep, I get you. So, I mean, one just quick thing I'll say, it just came to my mind, was so obviously someone who's running a, say, US company business only in the US or a UK only in the UK or Australia only in Australia wouldn't really be doing offshore because if it's going to get their government up their ass so fast, they won't know what hit them. Would you agree? Oh, exactly. Yeah, yeah. exactly. But there, there is ways that we can structure um, asset holdings, um, it, you know, through some some of the Caribbean jurisdictions where we can, you, know, you wanted to invest in the property in Florida, uh, we can do it, you know, set up a Nevis LLC, that LLC owns a Florida LLC, that Florida LLC then owns the Florida property. There's, uh, there's things of doing that that we can start, especially professionals in the US and that sort of stuff, uh, getting a, around their professional liability. You're giving me a and good point. We haven't point. even touched on uh, uh, setting up your own insurance funds or your uh, even even the uh, what what I call the bank of you, um, basically becoming your own bank. Um, these are structures that we can talk about later. Um, no, we'll that, do it in another call. We'll do it in another call that uh, that are, are, are very much save you a lot of money and, and turn a liability uh, into a, um, a med especially medical insurance uh, into an asset. You just got me reminded me, Stephen. Like, even for Australians, one of the things that we've done is that they who buy U.S. property, for example, like the problem with U.S. property is thanks to um, Obama, the state taxes are just awful. Whereas before, you had a three million dollars threshold. Whereas Obama's changed it, so now if you're an Australian and you buy U.S. property, um, but most Australians get the shock of their life not realizing that if they if they die, fifty five percent of the money. Of their, prop, of their property goes to the government and state taxes and it's have to be sold off. Whereas that can be easily avoided by, say, setting up a Virgin Islands company or um, State Shells company or Hong Kong company which actually owns the membership interest of an LLC and then there's no yeah. state taxes, as an example. Yeah, yeah that's, that's one way of doing it because you, you, and then the property is owned by the LLC and you only ever transfer the membership of the LLC. You never actually yeah. transfer the property. Uh, um, the way that a lot of a um, lot of ships and, and aircraft and that sort of stuff are all structured uh, are all that way. That it's the company that you transfer; it's not the asset itself. And then that way you get around stamp duties and a whole heap of other bits and pieces. Because stamp duty on shares is a lot less than stamp duty on on say a physical property. Yeah, in fact, you might be another scenario I was going to ask you about. So this is a this is a bit more curly one for you, Stephen. So I hope you had your coffee this morning. But basically, let's say I'm a US person and I'm single, okay? I, I don't have family, I don't have that. I'm wealthy, I'm doing okay. So I leave the US to get away from the tax system um, and I'm now living, say, in Thailand. Let's, let, let's just say it for example, because I'm a 53-year-old US guy, works well for me. There's one catch. Where am I going to structure myself? Because you know my challenge is that as a US citizen, I'm basically now the bitch of the US government for life, which means that basically, unless I actually remove my citizenship, which takes a five-year minimum, but is a huge thing to do, I'm basically supposed to still pay tax for the rest of my life, even if I'm not a resident for the US. So what would you be telling me? 
Well, if you, especially if you're single and, and all that sort of stuff, one of the ways to do it is, is to divest everything into a foundation or a charity um, and then have that, that foundation or charity um, basically run whatever cause it is. Uh, and that can be done, through, maybe that can actually be done through the US itself. You can set up a 501c3 uh, uh, organization that, that allows you then to take uh, donations from the, from the US and then you just work for that charity. So you put all your assets into that and your, your charity could be, uh, you know, it's saving the whales in, in the, the, the Gulf of Thailand or something like that and you live in Thailand to, to outwork your charity. What about That's even a Hong Kong Foundation? foundation? Or Panama Foundation, could you even do or that? Panama like Panama? Foundation. Yeah, any, anything, especially if you're single um, and you don't have a, a future generation to leave anything to, you might want to leave it to a charitable organisation uh, or, or do it to a, uh, some sort of charitable organisation that you have done that then it, and on your death will then distribute back to other charities. So then there's no, uh, no inheritance taxes or anything like that. You only then, and being an American, as long as you earn under 102,000 US dollars, you get the the uh, offshore uh, living income. So you can take 102,000 dollars a year tax free from your charity to be the CEO and general manager of the charity, and then the charity can then do do the rest of the investing. Yeah, excellent. That's really good, brilliant. Now another question. I've got a couple more. Um, one, one question, Stephen, is you mentioned yesterday, or in the banking one, about white tier, um, grey tier and black tier. So does it apply to offshore structures in the identical way, are there some slight differences? How, how would you, just re refresh everyone about that again, about those three yeah. different tiers and how it applies to offshore structures? Yeah, so um, the, the white tier, grey tier and black tier applies to offshore companies as much as it does to offshore banking. Basically, it applies equally the same. So, if you've got a trading company that you're dealing with um, people, you want to be in a, in a white tier jurisdiction. You want to be able to get your money. You want to be able to do co save, move contracts around where no one's going to feel uncomfortable. You want to be able to sign contracts in a jurisdiction that has a great legal system and is representative for trade and has great trade trade connections. Once again, this is why I like Hong Kong because Hong Kong ticks all these boxes. Uh, so does Malta. Um, so does a whole heap of uh, other jurisdictions around the place, that, uh, including the US. The US is, is um, and this is where the US actually becomes a great little loophole for people. If you're a non-US citizen, you own a Nevada company or LLC and you do not do business with um, the US, it's a tax-free enterprise. So you can actually set up a fund, um, a personal priv private office fund in Nevada and then have that as uh, your investment vehicle outside. So, so I'm, so you know, I'm an Australian. I set up this structure. I do not do anything with the U.S. people. I make sure whoever's doing the day-to-day -day administration knows that this company cannot do any any business with U.S. Uh, U.S. corporations or U.S. banks or U.S. anything. And then it opens accounts in the U.K., for instance, to do trading. So that's another yeah. way, of, another way of getting it, getting around. That that U.S. and using the U.S. as a as a as a tax haven or a um, a grey level. Just, so grey level countries. Then we're moving into the countries where where all the institutions play. So this is where you'd set up your hedge funds. You set up your um, uh, you 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 managed investment vehicles. So the Cayman Islands, the BVIs. Um, we're, we're getting into the Guernseys, the Isle of Man's, the, the Gibraltars. Um, here, here in Asia, where you're looking at Dubai, uh, Dubai is still a bit of a grey area uh, for doing business and trade, but it's a white tier jurisdiction if you're doing business in in the Middle East. So yeah. you, you can trade backwards and forwards. Once you start getting into the black tier, so these are the the the, the real doozy countries. So these are the places that are like the Cook Islands, the Marshall Islands, Samoa, the Seychelles. These are where your IP, this is where you want maximum protection, maximum privacy uh, that is afforded, uh, but you're not necessarily going to be dealing with anyone outside of your own group of companies. Yeah. Okay, is no, that's really, that? really good. Yeah. Very, very useful. So, just another question on all that. 
So I know that one of the things that when you're dealing with these countries, um, you've got actually before I go on to that one, you reminded me, and I was going to quickly mention this, of a client years ago who we they were doing business and we ended up sitting up in the Virgin Islands, but they really weren't comfortable Virgin Islands building or building with their clients. So what we did was we set up a New Zealand nominee company. The New Zealand company actually dealt with clients and then that just basically build build most of it. It was really just building agents, so we just had an agency yeah. agreement. So it had a small profit in New Zealand, like virtually nothing. The bulk of it ended up in the Virgin Islands, and they weren't even living in New Zealand. So it worked out really well. Yeah. So and and these are the things that um, that, that happen on a daily basis. Uh, you have a look at Google, Apple, Dropbox, Skype, uh, any of those major corporations, Cisco. Um, you know where Google. you can go to a meeting here. Um, all the billing happens through Ireland, which is owned then through Netherlands, which then all works its way back uh, yeah. to some Caribbean nation, whether it be BVI and that sort of stuff. And the, the US listed companies are basically just investment holding companies. They, they don't have a lot of great uh, depth to them uh, other than they're just an investment holding company because everything else is held everywhere else around the world. Yes. Now, one big curly question I've got for you. Yep. So one of the biggest challenges Western businesses face, so let's just say, I'll give you a case example. So let's say you've got someone like John and, you know, and, and Peter who live in Australia or even in US or UK, any of those three countries, we'll just say generic example so we don't pin it to one country. Let's say that they genuinely do business across the world. So there's no question, you know, they, 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 their business makes very little income from their home country, let's say 10%. 90% of it is international business. Yep. Now, the, one of the challenges they face in setting up offshore is, of course, the Australian government, the US, UK, now all under their CFC rules pretty much say that if the governance or leadership is happening from like Australia, from US to UK, then they just regard it as a resident company anyway of, of that one, and they tax it as if it was anyway. And so you get taxed whether you bring the money back in or not, because a common myth is that, oh, provided I leave it offshore, I'm okay. Whereas that's not the case at all. So yeah. how do you overcome that issue with the CSC? Like, do you appoint extra directors to the company? Is there some way where you have a management there and the director has minimal involvement or more limited involvement? What's your comments on that one? Because that's a big question. Yeah, so the day-to-day -day operations of the company has to be deemed to be offshore, has to be deemed to be yeah. in the jurisdiction or a jurisdiction that is not the jurisdiction. So being a director of a company um, doesn't necessarily mean that you run the company. So there, there might be five directors of the company. So there might be John, Pete, and then they end up, they appoint two independent directors. So all up, they only only control 25% of the vote of the board. Um, that company um, has a general manager. The general manager does the day to day operations of, of the firm. So that general yep. manager is actually the person doing the day to day uh, of it. It doesn't mean that directors can't be on committees that give advice and all that sort of stuff. It just means that they can't be deemed to be doing the day-to-day -day, day -day operations of the business. This is where, where a lot of my clients and that we work towards making them investors in their businesses, then we're doing managers of the businesses. And then that allows them to go and open other businesses and do other things. So by building up staff in the Philippines, by building up staff in say Hong Kong, uh, yep. or building up staff even in the U.S. and the in, in the U.K. Um, that that but that is doing the day-to-day -day operations, so they're not doing the day-to-day -day operations. When you're a one-man band, it does make it difficult. But the sooner that you can make your business to the stage where it is yep. not um, above that, uh, you know, that that is bigger than a one-man band, the better off you're going to be. And we can, uh, you know appoint general managers and um, getting proper business offices and, and all that sort of stuff uh, offshore. So you really need, I mean, what you've confirmed is what I've seen and even in the tax ruling in Australia and in the US, I've looked at all of that and like let's say you've got directors and they're giving all their board meetings in Australia or US, they've actually say, well that in itself they think makes it a Australian company or US. So to me it's critical that you have your offshore office, you're genuinely working on your business, not in it. You've got the your office set up over there. You've got the staff. You've got the manager, and even your board meetings and your main meetings are happening offshore. And really, 
you just like living in that country, giving some direction. That's what I've concluded. Yeah, and that's what it has to be. Uh, if you yep. truly don't want to pay tax at all, um, leave. Um, yeah. Go and go, go and live in a, in a no tax jurisdiction. Go and live in Monaco. Oh. Um, come and live here uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, li live in Thailand or somewhere like that for parts of the year. Um, as we'll talk about in, in the residency thing, getting yes. residency outside of your home jurisdiction in, in a low tax place um, you, is, is you could fact, really. Country. See, my direction even in my own business these days is I, I don't really take on many Australian clients anymore. Generally, I take on Australian clients, for example, or US clients or UK who are going to leave. Like, you know, yes. I had a UK client who I was helping and I just told them straight out. I said, you're being unrealistic in your expectations. If you're willing to leave UK with your family, we can get rid of your tax completely. If you stay there, um, you're going to have to either be able to get your business set up offshore and genuinely run offshore, or you're going to be paying taxes. And he actually, he yeah. concluded he was going to move. And Australia is the same. And so I turn away so many Australian clients now because I just say to them, you know, unless you're willing to turn your business into a non-services where you're only doing minimal stuff compared to what you're used to, a pure product business where it's genuinely outsourced, run internationally, you're just a director outside the business, then forget it, you know, because that's what Uber do, that's what Apple do, that's what Google do, Google do. I mean, these guys really do have genuine internationally run offices and businesses. Yeah, and, and that's what it all comes down to. If you want to remain a one-man band and, and you just want to run your business, well, run it offshore. Leave, go, yeah. go and live offshore and, and run it offshore. If you want to do that in Australia, we're going to pay some tax and you're going to, you're going to get tax, but you're going to get the other benefits having an offshore company around, asset protection, uh, at, at yep. open uh, opportunities uh, and, and other, and, and your thinking changes when you're, you're not just set up in Australia or you're not just set up in the UK. If you're set up internationally, your thinking is changed internationally. So eventually your business will grow uh, and, and you'll have to travel. If you have a look at the, the billionaires of the world, um, most of them are highly mobile. They'll have meetings in London, they'll have meetings in, in wherever, and they actually don't meet a lot of their, their taxation rules of their own countries because they don't spend a lot of time there. The ones that do, they just cop it and pay it. They minimise it because you know they're able to, to live off their investments. And this is why becoming an investor rather than a, a manager or director or owner um, affords you different tax um, statuses as well, especially yep. in the US. Your tax status as an investor um, is totally different to your, your tax status if you're um, uh, if you're running as a um, a, a, a nine to five wage earner. Um, you know, if you have a look at how Mitt Romney, you know, with his offshore investing and everything, he pays fifteen percent tax because he only earns in America income up to the fifteen percent level. So all his his uh, dividends from investment are taxed at fifteen percent. You know, but because he's deemed as an investor with a bit of a side gig, you know, and that's what you need to do. So you need to think in a couple of ways: divorce control from ownership, and divorce investment from managing, and or uh, sorry, investment from from operations and running day to day. This is good. I mean, very valuable stuff. We'll certainly explore these more in future calls. Um, last question, Stephen, before we conclude. What do you see in the future in terms of offshore structuring, where it's all going? I know we covered this banking. Would you say the same kind of things apply? I would say it's exactly the same as the, the banking rules. Um, more and more people um, are going to realise that there's better stuff over the, over the horizon. There's better stuff out there. There's more opportunities. We're becoming an ever mobile uh, world. Um, we're becoming a very much startup culture um, and People are wanting to explore freedom businesses and, and lifestyle businesses, uh, so we'll be seeing a lot more people um, branch out and, and move and, and become highly mobile and, and leverage their skills and, and move their skills around the world. Uh, so I think it, the future for offshore is very bright. Uh, it, there's yep. a lot more communities, especially in the, um, the expat and the digital nomad world where people are becoming more and more comfortable with it and, the, and there's more and more uh, discussion happening daily around it. Uh, so yeah, no, I think it's bright and I, I think it's only going to get easier. Governments are going to change eventually. We're going to see some, um, with Trump at the moment and with uh, the Brexit and a few other things happening around the world, I think we're going to see some um, interesting uh, period and interesting things happen over the next period of five years. Uh, but yeah. I, I can't see it being bad. 
uh, as long as you're informed, um, you're not sitting there uh, afraid by watching whatever the mainstream media is telling you, uh, out talking to people like us uh, who are got boots on the ground and, and, and who are working the system. No, in fact, the final comment I'm going to make, I, my, my, I told a client the other day, I said that it's not a question of if tax rates will, will reduce globally, it's when, because the sovereign individual by Rees, Mons and Davidson that we mentioned yesterday show that more and more governments are, move, are, being, are being forced into a value type government. So whereas rather than dictatorship where we're the big elite, we tell you what to do, where people will start becoming more educated and empowered for value. So Trump's woken up to that. He's going around making deals of four General Motors saying if you bring your plants back, we'll give you low tax and things like that. And that's what I see happening. I mean, America, it's not a question of if the corporate tax will drop, it's how much. Is it 15 or 20? The UK, the question from what I understand is, is it going to be 12.5 or 15? And yeah. Tony Abbott even went as far as to say in Australia, the Malcolm Turnbull recently in the paper, he said if you don't slash corporate tax rates very quickly, you'll be the laughing stock of the world and Australia will hit a recession worse than any other country um, ever, almost ever seen because everyone's just going to pull out like you wouldn't believe. Well, we already are a laughing stock. We've got 30% tax rates. Uh, the US have got 20, uh, 25. The UK has got 20. Um, half of Europe are 20, 22, 25. Uh, you know, Malta, if you're a foreign in the, in, um, investor in Malta, it's 5%. Um, mm. It's just ridiculous. Australia is at the highest end of the spectrum already. Uh, and uh, mm. Singapore 16.5. Hong Kong is 17%. Um, the, everything's changed. Even China is reducing its tax rates. They're, they're at 30, 33 percent. They're talking about going to 20. So uh, everyone is, is talking about tax rate reductions except Australia. Excellent. Well, thank you, Stephen. I appreciate your time and I look forward to, um, to our next, next call on offshore residency. Stay tuned, everyone. Definitely. Thank you, everyone, and we'll talk to you next time. Audio Jungle.